Welcome to the Online Great Books Podcast, brought to you by OnlineGreatBooks.com, where we talk about the good life, the great books, great conversation, and great ideas. I'm Scott Hambrick. I'm Carl Schutt. And today on the Online Great Books Podcast, we're going to talk about Yukio Mishima's book, Sun and Steel. He is the third author, I think, that we've talked about twice. We did, uh, we've had done a couple Hall of, of Fame. Yeah, we've done a couple of Tolkien books uh, or pieces and a Walker Percy, I think, and then now, now this guy. Haven't we done Nietzsche twice? We're fitting to. Haven't we done My Friend Friedrich a couple of times? I don't know. I don't think so. We need to. Well, and today is a very special show mm. because we have a guest. Yeah, we have uh, our friend and boss from uh, Barbell Logic. <laughs> oh, Lord. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so this is interesting. I have, I think, at least three bosses, mm. and two of them are on this podcast. Oh, no. <laughs> it's, Melissa! I've said many times. First off, thanks for having me on the show. <laughs> you're welcome. Oh, you're I'm welcome. Excited. It's a pleasure. I'm excited to be on the show. I feel uh, wildly unqualified. I'm happy that we are going to be talking about a book today from a famous author who basically shunned his previous intellectual career <laughs> and basically gave rise to his physical prowess. And so uh, it's the only way that I could, if we had to, if we were doing a call, uh, a, a podcast on uh, Aristotle, I would, I would probably have politely declined. No, no, no. Oh, it would be so much fun. No, Aristotle but since this good. guy decided that words are corrosive and that steel is awesome, then we're right up my alley. Yeah, I, I think he's right. So so a lot of folks don't know, but Matt was my co-host, or I was his co-host on the Barbell Logic podcast for, I don't know, around 700 hours or something like that until like last yeah, many year. many years, yeah. And th this show here, I guess, is a weird cousin of the Barbell Logic show. And uh, then, of course, the Music and Ideas show is me and Carl and Trent. And Trent used to engineer and produce that show, the Barbell Logic show. So we're all pod buddies and... Uh, yeah, and sisters, life. sisters as they would. Yeah, yeah. So, so Matt is uh, <laughs> yes. Matt's a, a former strong man, a business owner, a father, a Calvinist, and um, oh, there we go. And a normie. <laughs> By the way, you owe me a discussion. You owe me a book discussion, Matt. Uh, I do. Yeah, we um, we'll cover this one one time. You just say when when we talk about confessions. No, 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 no. That uh, that oh, no. Sy systemic Not heresy common. book that Gudam. What is it? Systematic theology. Oh, by okay. Yeah, s systematic. <laughs> I thought we were supposed to do That's Lonesome Dove. I read a thousand pages of that thing, and we still have. I could do that one too. I love Lonesome Dove. Yeah, we need to do the good big fan. Book. Big fan of systematic theology too. Yeah. No, you're not. That's okay. No. No, that book right there is. Uh, well, we could save it for the show. It is postmodern. Yeah, we'll save, we should save it for the it show. It's postmodern modern in its outlook. <laughs> I think I could put you off of that, it's it's crazy that you would yeah I mean I from someone who is so deeply rooted in the classics I could see how they would take anyone who is reformed and has an outlook from the 1500s and say that they're post not reformed revolutionary and say that they're postmodern no uh no Cal Calvin but, and Martin Luther uh and Francis Bacon are the birth of postmodernism shots fired who do you like Yukio <laughs> Mashima <laughs> Let's agree on that guy. So we've talked about this guy before. Uh, we read his book, uh, Sound of Waves, which Carl said is the perfect little book. Yeah, it's just yeah. a great novel. You'd read Sun and Seal and you think, well, that one's going to be all about suicide and death and, and blood. And it's not. It's just, nope. it's wonderful. I highly recommend Sun and Seal. Or no, um, Sound of Waves. Uh and he's got a bunch of other ones, which I'm probably going to dig into. This one is a late work of his. Uh, it's it's very odd. What's attractive about it for us and why we thought, I think why we thought to get Matt on was the emphasis on the power of steel to do something to the self. When I read Mishima, I think when he's talking about himself, I think I can relate. He talks, he has this image of these little white ants that are words that corrode the thing. What are they? Termites or something? I don't know. Whatever they have in Japan that his focus on words, he was a bookish kid 
and he would he would go into the dark and he would write these novels and stories and everything and cultivate all of that I don't know how to how to say this. Scott has said sometimes he thinks some people don't have an internal monologue. I think that's probably true, but I think some of us, myself included, have too much internal monologue. Hmm. Yes. Yeah, Mishima. This book's 108 pages, by the way. If I bought the Kindle edition, and I had read like 90 pages, and it said I'd only read 26% of it, and I, <laughs> I was in a panic. But the stupid Kindle edition repeats the book three times. Oh, that's weird. You mm-hmm. wouldn't even let me get the Kindle edition. I ordered the paperback. It isn't going to be here till tomorrow. And so I had to pull the whole, download <laughs> the PDF and printed it out. I, so, which I, I realize is, so, so one, I stole the book, but I also bought the book. <laughs> so I at least bought the book. It's just not here yet. So yeah, I ended up printing the thing out. And so, I mean, it's yeah. double-sided print. It's only 50 pages and it's re- yeah, it's really interesting. You know, what Carl was saying, it's, it's interesting. He has this to piggyback off that where he talked about how the corrosion of words damages the integrity of the man of action. So it was like he he is seeing that he had this internal monologue that was too much, right? That there was too much. It was this great emphasis on words and words alone and that the words alone never led to action. It didn't take him to the place that he actually wanted to be. And it left this hole. You could tell he, he was searching for something greater and in his later life, which was, in fact, is what his mid thirties, not not his eighties, he became a man of action, and he discovered the physical side of this thing, right? And he, and it's interesting because you you then the whole book is sort of playing on this sort of battle between the corrosion of words and words and flesh, words and flesh, and like what's the correct balance? And you could tell that like, he struggled with. He had a real internal yeah, struggle with balance. it. And, I'm not sure he found that. And it's super interesting. <laughs> super interesting. Should we spoil it and tell people how he ended? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Well, did you talk about that when you talked about the first the Mishima incident? You can all look that up. I love it. It's the most Japanese way to die. So he born. I think he was born in 1930 or maybe it was 1928, something <laughs> like this. This is from memory. Somebody will correct me. 1925. There you go. So in 1945. He was 1925. Uh, And we know what happened in 45. He was in the military, but he never, uh, he never saw action and uh, didn't go well for Japan. uh, He was a citizen of, of Japan, a a subject of the emperor and the emperor and his people, his staffers surrendered to the United States on the, on the, that battleship. (laughs) And, uh, he never really did. In the mid '60s, he started a group called the Shield Society, and I think it was in seven. I think it was '70. They staged a, a, an attempted coup to overthrow the Marshall Plan government that the United States had installed there, and to re- reinstate the emperor. The Shield Society knew that they would fail, and he committed Harry Carey on television. And uh, a few works were released posthumously, so he knew this was all part of his plan. He had, uh, I think, that he ultimately saw controlling one's death as one of the most noble and proper ways for a person to act, particularly Japanese. Brings up there's a lot of interesting things, yeah. you know. So if your Mishima in your in your family is literally a long line of samurai. And uh, your emperor cucks. How do you surrender? What does that look like? (laughs) Well, if the emperor had been divine, had claimed divinity for, you know, 2000 years or something, and then all of a sudden says, (laughs) nope. Right. You know, that's a big step. But that's not really what I want to talk about. The end. Uh, I mean, you can see a lot of it in this book. Uh, You guys have page numbers. I want to read a quote. I'll, I'll get close. It's somewhere around page seven. I have. I have Kindle page numbers. Right. If myself was my dwelling, then my body resembled an orchard that surrounded it. I could either cultivate that orchard to its capacity or leave it for the weeds to run riot in. I was free to choose, but the freedom was not as obvious as it might seem. Many people do indeed go so far as to refer to the orchards of their dwellings as destiny. Yeah. One day... It occurred to me to set about cultivating my orchard for all I was worth. For my purpose, I used sun and steel. 
Well, there you go. There's the title. That's a nice paragraph. I always love it when I'm sure you guys do this all the time on this podcast, but when you've got the whole section underlined that that whole section is underlined for me that Carl just read because it's such a powerful piece. I do this. I, I mean, I'm a middle-aged, you know, hashtag neat dad. I love taking care of my yard. I love to, you know, like Scott, you've your farm, you're out working in your farm. I've got my land. I, I love cultivating the land. So that idea of spending the time actually cultivating the land, cultivating the yard, making it like the orchard, produce good fruit and and not and not just be productive but also look great right there's this idea of what a cultivated orchard looks like and he starts to see his own body is like wait a minute that's that is my orchard i can actually and then you actually see a lot of this discussion throughout the book of it's not just about the looks of the cultivation of the orchard but the actual the actual uh performance or the production of the fruit that building the strength uh, that he got out of the out of the sun and out of the steel, primarily the steel. Uh, super interesting. Unceasing sunlight and implement of steel became the chief elements in my husbandry. Yes, he takes responsibility for his body, and he does this as a reaction to the decision by words. Page sixteen, he says, "Granted that my flesh in infancy had made itself apparent in intellectual guise, corroded by words, then should it not be possible to reverse the process to extend the scope of an idea from the spirit to the flesh until the whole physical be- being became a suit of armor forged to the metal of that concept?" He 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 keeps going. He goes on and on about that. So, like, yeah, he wants to like cultivate his body, but then around that page six, he starts talking about like. Making ideas concrete in the form of his bo- body, and like and his body was right, the ideas would be right. Am I wrong about that, Carl? Carl's grinning as much as Carl can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it gets boy, it gets pretty metaphysical in this book. I don't know how to go from the particular to the abstract to the universal, and for him, the getting your muscles. Uh, I'm not going to be able to find the quote, but getting your muscles to be stronger and larger is to join the universal. So like the slumping belly and the caving in chest he talks about as almost like moral failures. Your perversions are particular. Your glory is universal. Is is he trying to make his body the um, platonic form of humanness? Is he trying to tap into the universal by approaching that perfection? Is that what it is? Uh, yeah, except here's the the cool part. The form is physical. The, the thing about words, I was that hit you. I, a little, was that a little close to home, Carl? It's uh, <laughs> hits me close to home. I, I so this is a little bit of a personal story. Um, so uh, Catholics generally, well, some of us go to therapy, but we all, we have this confession thing. Okay, I remember I was in once, and I was stopped by the monastery and went in. And I was chat talking to the priest. And I was given all sorts of words and everything. He was an old guy, and he finally stopped. And he says, you know what? You talk real well about this. Hmm. But you ought to just stop. You know, that, you know whatever I was uh, talking about. Like, I had all the theory and all of the, and the words and the concepts and to explain, you know, all the reasons why I was screwing up. And he just said, you know, to hell with the words. In the end, it's action. That there's a primacy of action in the physical to all the words that we make to, you know, we do crazy things with words. They're, they're my business, but it's like, I remember I was reading, um, Jonathan Haidt wrote a book. I can't remember what it's called, but in the middle of it, he talks about, he comes down and there's a cake in the fridge and he eats the cake. And then his wife comes down and sees that the cake is gone or a big chunk of it's gone and says, why did you do that? And now he starts coming up with words. Well, because I had a rough day, I deserved it. Or, you know, remember that other day you did this thing? Well, I needed the cake. You know, and so he comes up with words to justify the action that he did. But it's all bullshit, frankly. After the fact, rationalization, uh, little white ants in Mishima's terms. I'm interested. One of the things that I'd, I'd be interested from you guys knowing that you're far more well read than I, it's always weird to have a conversation with guys like you who, for most of the people that I run with, I'm the well read guy. I read all the time. I mean, I'm constantly reading, but, but you are both so well read. If you didn't know the author here 
and you didn't know his story, where would you place the timeline of this book? Because to me, it's not 1970. This feels like I'm reading something out of the Shogunate, right? Like it's the, this guy's, this guy, it's 1300. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And and part of that is in the, is in the, how much is lost in the translation. Like I know it's been written in Japanese, therefore it's translated into English. And so I don't know how well I, we can read English classical literature and by its very nature, because English is our primary language, we can pick up on the fact that it's old, right? It's a little, it's a little more different, but I'm looking at this and I'm reading it. I'm going, <laughs> this does not sound like it was written 50 years ago. It sounds like it was written 700 years ago. Is it like a, a samurai in the full outfit in his garden with a calligraphy brush? That's, I mean, that's exactly what it sounds like to me. And I, and I think a lot of it's because that's who he idolized, right? I mean, is that not who he tried to become at the end? Well, I mean, he was a samurai. I, I, I become my right. Know, his uncles, his grandparents. But not, but not for the first right. thirty years hey, of his he, life. He said, "Right," and so that's that. He's writing now from the perspective of someone who is a modern day samurai. But it doesn't feel like modern day Tokugawa. It feels like seven hundred years ago. I read it, and other than the weird death death themes that we'll get into, and even a little bit of that, uh, you know, he's saying stuff that Socrates and Aristotle and, st- and those guys said. You know, those guys had to drop everything and go to war uh, any time. You know, that's part of what being a citizen was. And they were big on the gymnasium, and it was body and mind for those guys. And it was closely linked. And uh, yeah, and he, he talks about the Greeks a little bit too. Yeah, it's, it doesn't read like 1970. And that's why I love him. Well, I want to read this chunk. I'd always felt that such signs of physical individuality as a budging belly, sign of spiritual sloth, or a flat chest with protruding ribs, sign of an unduly nervous sensibility, were extremely ugly, and I could contain my surprise when I discovered that there were people who loved such signs. To me, these could only seem acts of shameless indecency, as though the owner were exposing his spiritual pudenda on the outside of his body. <laughs> they represented one type of narcissism that I could never forgive. <laughs> I've got a friend. He's like, I hope this mask stuff, this COVID mask stuff. I, he's like, I hope it ends because all these ugly fuckers are covering their face. And it's like, it's just everything much more pleasant for me. He's serious as he could possibly be. Like, <laughs> I, I'll, I get hate mail for every show, so it doesn't matter. I don't take it yeah. quite. I know you're too pleasant. I don't take it necessarily to this guy's extreme, but, uh, I never get hate mail. There is sort of a narcissism in just in, in just like the flagrant neglect of appearance, hygiene, etc. You know, you, you go to you go to Walmart and you see the crazy person with that's in their house shoes that are filthy sure. and they're enormous and like you can see parts of their body that clothes normally cover. When the cover of Cosmo magazine is a six hundred pound person. And says, you know, this is what beauty looks like today. And if and if you don't think so, you're fat shaming. Like, you know that that person's morbidly obese and has one foot, one and three quarters feet in the grave already. It's not, in fact, isn't okay. Like, there are, obviously there are parts of this, and I'm I'm sure he probably dealt with this too. There there are things that none of us are born physically or mentally or socially perfect in any way, shape, or form. Obviously, as the Calvinist, I think we're all completely screwed up <laughs> but i also do think that on some if if we're focused on right. the physical there are things that we have control over right we have control over the bulging belly the flat chest you don't necessarily have control over how far apart your eyes are right or if your ears are asymmetrical like there's th- those things can't be changed but i you could see for him to say he in that passage you just read scott like that it represents to him a type of narcissism that is unforgivable like it's i right. It literally says, like, he flips it. He flips it. Everyone looks at bodybuilders and says, you're the narcissist. You assholes are sitting around doing nothing, Mm. getting fat, don't care, right? Don't care about your appearance. Put your spiritual pedenda away. (laughs) Spiritual pedenda. It's amazing. (laughs) We don't use pedenda enough. We don't, and we also don't then relate it to the spir- to spirituality very often, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's, no, it's yeah, it's a great line. Yeah, I like that the way that's flipped. So when you take charge of your, I'm gonna I'm gonna agree with Mishima here. 
Uh, when you take charge of your physicality, when you, you know, hire one of us, maybe start training and get your stuff together. This is where it's a little weird for Mishima. You're not becoming more of an individual. You're becoming less of one. Yeah. You're becoming more of the classical figure from ancient Greece. You know, the ideal man where uh, the, your muscles are looking like they should look and the sagging belly and everything. When you let it go wrong, that's when it becomes particularized. I think people demonstrate that too. They're like, hey, man, I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to be who I want to be. I'm going to look how I want to look. And, uh, you know, if I weigh 345, you're supposed to be attracted to me no matter what because this is me. Even in the modern U.S., I think a lot of that neglect of the body is about exercising your right to be an individual, whatever the heck that means. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. exactly that's right. Gross, slothful life. That's well said. Matt Reynolds, do yeah. you agree 100% with Mishima then? I want to try to get Matt to agree with everything Mishima says. I, I would. I would. I just want to be clear that sometimes people will take, and just like you do, <laughs> just like they do with you, is that I got a bunch of hate mail bullshit a while ago for saying some things about, um, I was talking about, on a, I was being in, interviewed on a podcast, and I was talking about a, a, a female, how females can't really get bulky. Mm -hmm. It's not really possible to get bulky the way, the way culturally we, you know, like too muscular, too whatever. That the only way to do that, to really like appear too bulky, is that either A, they're taking performance enhancing drugs, which, you know, most of our middle aged clients certainly aren't. Or often someone starts in this very unhealthy, morbidly obese, I use the word sloppy, and what you don't understand is they've, they've lost 30 or 40 pounds, and they're still 265, and then somebody sees them for the first time and says, well, that person's too, and they, so it's, then it's amazing. So, of course, I get in trouble for saying that when they started at 320 that they were sloppy, like how dare you judge anybody for, that was the bullshit that I heard. And and when I want to be clear, like there there was it was obvious for Mishima as well. Like this is a process that takes time, right? That it's actually the process. You could see he was constantly working on this thing. This was a ten year thing that occurred, right? This wasn't like you woke up one day and he went from a sloth with the bulging belly and the flat chest and the you know to uh, his version of a bodybuilder of a classical Greek model. And so I think the idea there is that that he's trying to promote is that we are trying to constantly refine ourselves and get better, not not just in the intellectual, which I think he had spent those previous thirty years doing, and found that there was it was incomplete. But to say like that there's a real value in this to do the same thing on the physical side, and it's this idea that we constantly talk about at Barbell Logic and and just among each other of voluntary hardship. He understood that. As much as he studied and as much as he read and as much as he wrote, there was this missing piece of the pie, of the voluntary hardship pie. And until he brought about, until he pursued the voluntary hardship of, of physical strength of the sun and steel, he was unable to complete it. And I think he's, his argument is, is that anyone on earth who isn't able to or who hasn't been through that fire who hasn't tried to do that thing and been refined has not been able to achieve that, that completion of that voluntary <sighs> hardship. And so it's, yes. of course, yeah, I absolutely would agree with that idea. It's not just about the hardship though. And he really is in the aesthetics. Like he's got to, he's got to express that wordless beauty. And then when he does no. that, he can think more clearly and then he can act and he becomes complete. Yes. Hmm. Yeah, he says, I was recognizing the identical origin of the formal beauty in the wordless body and the formal beauty in words. I was beginning to seek a kind of platonic idea that would make it possible to put the flesh and words on the same footing. The United States needs this. We need this real bad. Modernity needs this real bad. I'm taking welding, Matt Reynolds. I talk about it every show now. I'm taking welding class at the local vocational school. I'm the oldest guy in class. Nice. Of course. And a uh, bunch of 18-year-olds. Yeah. There's this one kid. He's, he looks like Don yeah. Knotts. Yeah, you get him right. He, he wears like a seven and an eighth hat. Like he's got a head, like a pencil eraser. He's just got a little bitty head. <laughs> and he's wearing this welding cap, and it's bright red. I, I wasn't going to tell this story. <laughs> I'm going to tell it. Because he has such a tiny head, 
the hats, the welding caps, real tall, and it's bright red. And uh, his name, you know, all those kids are named Cooper. I've been through this before. So I'm like, hey, Cooper, like, where do you get these receptacle right. tip welding hats? And he's like, oh. <laughs> like they just can't take it. Like they don't get picked on. They don't do all that workplace grab ass stuff that, you, you know, we used to do like on construction sites <laughs> and stuff. But anyway, we're taking this welding class. Right. And I, I can tell, I can tell that these young men have a little, sure. like most of them want to be pipeline welders. Th- th- they're trying to m- take on a career. And our, our teacher, Mr. Cooper is doing his best to help them. It's, oh, it's, they make right. great money. These young guys are going to make a hundred grand That's at right. twenty years old, is. and then go up from there. But you can tell that they they have a little. Sure. They're like, "What do you do, handbrake?" And I tell them, tell them, well, you know, right. they, it's hard to explain to them. Well, I'm semi-retired, but now I work more than I ever have. <laughs> One of those, <laughs> right? But they've got a little bit of an inferiority <laughs> complex because they live in the modern United States and they intend to do something with their hands for a living. We've got this thing now where we have a caste system that has emerged in the United States. Like, well, if you have a white collar job, if you're a knowledge worker, you're a certain kind of person. But if you actually do things with your hands or rely on your body every day to work, well, then, you know, you failed. You know, something went wrong, right? And the, the, the natural extension of that idea is that the, to use your body is base. To use your body is, in, is an yeah. inferior use of the of the human per- being that's right qed <laughs> because of all this stuff mm-hmm. we have people particularly young men who eschew the body they are disconnected from their bodies and they don't they don't like their bodies and they keep a great deal of distance from them i think that's where you get the five foot ten guy that weighs a buck 27 in the skinny jeans if you – he knows – this is subconscious, I think. But I think that there's something about him that's like if I right. can if I can communicate by my appearance that I'm unable to do physical things, I'm not a plumber, and that I must be up in my mind, and I'm a knowledge worker, and I'm, I'm a certain kind of high caste, C-A-S-T-E, American modern person. That ain't so. So we have you know young people – you know, you lock them up yeah. in their house for a year. They play video games. Their life is online. Uh, working with your hands is gross and dirty, and only for immigrants. Blah blah blah. And you end up with we end up with these broken people with low sperm counts who are ineffectual, can't fix a dripping faucet, and are just at the whim of the of reality. Sure. Frankly, we need to put this flesh and words on the same footing, like yeah. Mishima. Yeah, yeah. It's all the worst parts of Platonism. Darn those video games. This is one of our uh, colleagues said on one of the Slack channels to somebody, you need to play more video games. And I didn't respond, right. but I, I just sat there and I looked at it and said, no, no, I don't. I really don't. I need to go plant my radishes. That uh, the return to the physical, we're too much in our heads, I think, to the detriment of the body. But I, I want to go back to something Matt was talking about, the aesthetic aspect of the body. I think it is important. I, this is a dangerous topic to talk about. I had a student, one of the best students I ever had, who somebody made some comment about her looking a little heavy. And, and nine years later, she's dead from starving herself. You know, I mean, there is that. But on the other hand, on the other hand, you don't know the glories that your body is capable of. Yep. It, you got to take care of it and <laughs> you got to lift heavy things. There's this line that, that made me hit my macros a little stronger this week. <laughs> Let's see. So this is somewhere around page 24. The need for me to train my body could have been foreseen from that moment when I first felt the attraction of the surface profundities. I was aware that the only thing that could justify such an idea was muscle. Who pays any attention to a physical education theorist grown decrepit? Mm. <laughs> so I thought, all right, all right, I guess I'll... I'll uh, I'll hit my numbers this, this week, you know, because it's important. The physical presentation you make, it's your body that expresses your ideas, and it's right. not just by words. That's right. You know, again, in modernity, we, we tend to judge for or look down upon people for judging a book by its cover, but isn't what we're really trying to do. I'm trying to look the part of what I believe. I actually want somebody to look at me and and go, like, this guy looks like... He owns a fitness company. He's a CEO of a 
of a large scale business. He's smart. He's not a meathead. He's like there's and and finding that balance is not always easy. Uh, not not just certainly that's understated. It's nearly impossible, right? But you also see from from him, he says you can see that he understands that there's this two way street or there's this one way street thing that that's occurring where he says like he he was unable to improve the flesh his flesh from the intellectual alone. And yet he says, and yet it seemed to me that the flesh could be intellectualized to a higher degree, could achieve closer intimacy with ideas than the spirit. So it's like he notes, it's not a two way street that for him, the intellectual actually also came up when he was able to drive up his, his physical ability, the way he looked. Mm -hmm. Right. And then Scott, you were saying too, a little bit ago and he calls back to the I love it he he starts to you can see he starts to really note the struggle or the problem of modernity when he's speaking to he says the groups of muscles that have become virtually unnecessary in modern life though still a vital element of a man's body are obviously pointless from a practical point of view and bulging muscles are as unnecessary as a classical education is to the majority of practical men Muscles have gradually become something akin to classical Greek. To revive the dead language, the discipline of the steel was required. To change the silence of death into the eloquence of life, the aid of steel was essential. <laughs> I know. I'm around in this point, and that's when I texted <laughs> Carl. I was like, can, can, can we have Reynolds on the show? <laughs> so, I always like it when we have the same things. Yeah, I have that whole paragraph it's outlined. So it feels so good. Yep. Uh, th- I think yep. most of the people that listen to the show know, but I'll say it. I'll say it again anyway. All three of us are barbell coaches. We help people use not the steel cast iron and the steel barbell to get real strong. Uh, and some of us here are from time to time very very strong. We teach people how to squat, really deadlift, press, and bench press, lead normal people, normal uh, homeschool moms, and uh, 61-year-old uh, IT dudes to uh, compete in public to lift as much weight as they possibly can and test their bodies to the to the most. And, you know, you guys listen to the show. You know, Carl and I read these books and talk about this stuff all the time. And then when we're not doing this, we're probably thinking about, <laughs> about how to live something better or teach somebody else how to do it better. We've spent a great deal of time on this. I came to it later in my life than these two guys did. But as a result of coming to it later, I think like Mishima did, the differences in mind and body are more stark for somebody who doesn't do this at all and then comes to it at 35 years old or 40 years old or 60 years old. And uh, I have experienced that. Everything is better. Every single thing is better yeah. if your deadlift goes up. Sure. And it makes your novels better. Apparently. Is, <laughs> so says is that why Truman uh, and Cody sucks? So there's a, let's see, this is a little bit before 27. Bulging muscles, a taut stomach, and tough skin, I reasoned, would correspond respectively to an intrepid fighting spirit, the power of dispassionate intellectual judgment, and a robust disposition. The mind and the, the body are connected. This is a, a hard idea for a lot of us. Yeah. The mind and the body are connected. This is right after the bit about the bulging belly. And so you get your physical house in order and you find out, you know, you might find out things don't bother you as much. You know, that you might ha- dispassionate intellectual judgment. Well, all right, something crazy happened in the news, but I can still deadlift 500 pounds. You know, and you feel... I, one thing I noticed in being in rooms with <laughs> coaches yeah. is the way they fill the space. And I don't mean that they take up more space, I'll although they usually too. do. Yeah. yeah, I used to like that because I would feel normal sized. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not as tall as I you think guys, of you but, as small. It's hilarious. Right. I'm like, Carl, Carl, he's very small, a little small guy. Yeah, I am. I'm uh, Well, I'm under six feet and I'm small. small guy guy that bench presses 500 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> not yet. Not yet. But, uh, <laughs> but, you know, they just stand differently, mm-hmm. stride the earth differently. And if you, dear listener, could partake of that, I think it would be a good thing. This is not just for meatheads, although good for meatheads. I think this book is an aesthetic project. Okay. this So it's Nietzschean. It's like 
take your life and make it a project, make it a beautiful life. And you're going to need sun and steel for that. Yeah. That's the appeal. There's a, there's a thing that we deal with in our culture a lot too, that I specifically our niche for those that have been in the strength niche that I, that I think sometimes the pendulum gets swung too far that direction as well. We've seen the powerlifting has developed a, um, a reputation for pursuing strength and a, a complete lack of aesthetics. And I think there's some emptiness there as well, right? In the same way that I think that, that bodybuilding, with, when the goal is to only get on stage and have a beauty pageant with other guys in a pink thong piece of underwear, like is also, that's not, you're, you're missing the mark, right? Now, it's, it's certainly better than being the sloth on the couch watching Netflix all day, but he started, Mishima really started to see the connection between aesthetics the strength and what the feeling of the strength, what the gain, like, you know, he would talk, he literally kind of talks about titrating the weight up as I added more weight. Like I could see the the strength was mine and the strength belonged to the steel itself. Like there was this battle that was going on there. And then the way that then improved his own, the, the intelligence portion, like he felt like that really came into fruition as well. So he saw the connection between all of them. And I think when we, when we lean into, we all know people who are all, all they want to, B is they they want to be the smartest guy in the room, but they're that again that you know their skin is pasty white and they they look awful, and then you've got you've got the bodybuilder often on the other side who is as a body of a Greek god, but an IQ of sixty eight and doesn't care to ever make it better. You've got the power lifter sometimes who is incredibly strong but weighs three hundred sixty pounds and is also morbidly obese but is can perform right the thing that it's the thing that i've struggled with for a lot of my life and and i actually i think as i read this because i didn't you know your most of your listeners don't know me i just i i've gone through a period of time when i was i was an ex i'm an ex pro strongman i I was a relatively high level power lifter but i spent most of my life trying to gain a ton of weight to get as strong as i could and now here i am in my early 40s and i'm like 300 pounds isn't healthy anymore and so I've worked really hard for the last four or five months to lose. I've lost 32, 33 pounds. I've lost eight inches off my waist. My strength is still pretty good, but not as good as it was then. But I look a lot better and I feel a lot better. I'm a lot healthier and everything seems to just be firing on all cylinders better. And right. so I haven't found the perfect balance of that either, but it's there are these places where people, you can always push the envelope too much in one. And this thing is really about the balance of all. Yeah, Mishima says on page 27, his own scanty experience is enough to furnish me with innumerable examples of timid minds in case of yeah. bulging muscles. Like, so he's not okay with that. There, there, you have to have both for him. I think, I don't think it is vanity. Is it Carl? Well, just because vain people do the same things that serious people do. Doesn't mean that what serious people do is vanity. Uh, but so imagine you go to a, go to the zoo, okay? You go to the zoo and they've got a lion, okay? And you go to the lion exhibit, and this is a fat lion. This is a <laughs> you know a sad lion. Um, I don't know. The lion's happy; he doesn't have to hunt. They just throw him hamburger. But he has diabetes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and you look at it and you say, "I want to go see the lion." And you go look at it and it and it's just it's not what it should be. You know, it's not being the fulfillment of lionhood. It needs to to be to look noble, it needs to look like it could kill you. It, it needs to have uh some muscle to its frame. This is no good. It shouldn't be this way. You would think the zookeepers had done something wrong. The lion doesn't have an intellect, as far as we know, it can't make these decisions. Well no pretend you're a, I don't know, you're an alien and there's a human zoo and you go see the humans and you see a human with no muscle and a whole bunch of fat, just sitting around eating Cheetos uh, off his chest. It's a human enclosure, a cube farm. Is that, is that what a human is? You know, these are like the human zoo. No, they have free range humans. <laughs> Your pee is more yellow. You can tell there's more vitamins in it. The free range humans. <laughs> It's like a good egg yolk. Yeah, but we do this all the time with, with things that are not humans. We say, this is the way it ought to look. Mm. Yeah. You know, I, I trimmed my clematis 
vines because they weren't looking right. Because there's a way that they ought to look. <laughs> you had this, you trimmed what? <laughs> Clematis? Clematis? I, I don't know. Yeah, it's I flowers. Trim, I trim my vine uh, once every four or five days as well. <laughs> I'm actually talking about a plant, <laughs> Matt Reynolds. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> but you know, you have an idea what it's supposed You know, your roses, they're supposed to look a certain way. Uh, sure. You know, if you cook food, it's supposed to come out a certain way. There's, We have hierarchical categories of, of being. There are things that we don't have any problem saying it ought to be that way. And then we come to the human and we stop. Yeah, for Mishima, nope. it's, no. it's not even an ought. Like, you ain't human unless you are those things. Or not fully human, or right. as human as you possibly could be. Another thing I've said that gets me in trouble. I like to repeat the things I say that get me in trouble. It's like, there are things that are part of the experience of being a male, a man, a human with this kind of pudenda. I want to, I want to use that every day for the next week. Pudenda. <laughs> Spir- <laughs> but you have to use the word spiritual before it. Cause it's it makes it that much weirder. I think that's a good band name. Carl's going to play tambourine. <laughs> To be married is part of it, I think. Some people would agree would disagree with this. To have ch- to raise children, to uh, get in a fist fight. Like there are certain things that are part of the male experience. And the degree to which you don't do all of those things is degree the degree to which you have not partaken in maleness. And there are a lot of things like that that I haven't done. I've not been in armed combat. Oh, that is something that, you know, in Greece it would have been expected. Or for Mishima's great grandparents, you know. Sure. So there, there are a lot of those things that I haven't experienced, and, and frankly, don't want to. I'm scared of it. But deadlifting something heavy yeah. enough that your that you that your vision goes black is uh, one of the things that people can do, and because it's one of the things that they can do, and there's all kinds of virtue associated with it. I think they should. Uh, there are all kinds of things that we can do that there aren't virtues associated with, and I don't want to do that. Yeah. So I, I can go into why I think that it's a good thing to do, and because it's possible for you to do a good thing, I think you should do it. And then you're more fully what you can be. You have partaken in those virtues as at least more, maybe not as much as you can, but at least more. In addition to the action, you know, my no Matt, you're really in, interested in like doing the work, experiencing the hardship, making yourself do the thing that you intellectually maybe don't want to do. In addition to that, though, he, he wants us to look like that. Like he wants us to be the embodiment of, he, he wants you to, like when you do these things, you look a certain way. Right. He wants to see that. And, but he, yep. not only does he want to see it, but he wants the muscles. And at some point in here, he says that he lacked the muscles that were necessary to have a, a proper dramatic death. So pretty early in his life, like, yes. like maybe it is late twenties to early thirties. Like I don't look good enough to die. Well, <laughs> yeah, to even perform ritual suicide in the case of war, the most honorable way to die. He's like, I, I am not worthy to perform ritual suicide like, <laughs> in the midst of war because I look like crap. I, I got to get this fixed. If I'm gonna, if I'm gonna, st- if I'm gonna stick a knife in my belly and turn it, I better look better for that. For that, it's it's so weird. But I would hope none of the listeners are are that. That's kind of the ultimate goal for them is is ritual suicide. But it's up there. Certainly, that is that is probably about as voluntarily hard as you could possibly get. <laughs> but you know what's not? You talked about. Anybody can deadlift and everybody should deadlift to the point at some point that they deadlift enough weight that like the octave of the music drops to, you know, two octaves and your sight goes black. but you don't start there. I can't you deadlift that much. I can squat you, that much, but you don't, you don't start there, right? You start conservative and you work your way up, but like you start moving that direction. And I was th- like, we haven't even touched on the sun part. Like what's been around longer, the, the sun or humans, um, right? The sun. In what percentage of human history have we been going out into the sun? Well, in fact, it's probably less than 100% all the way up into the last 30 years. And then we decided that the sun was evil and it will give everyone cancer and everyone will die if they go out in the sun. And yet for all of human history, there it, it's the same thing. There's this look that you have when you've been working and toiling outside, when you've Mm -hmm. built the muscles, that idea when we think of like farm strong, you know, we're we're all Midwestern guys, those 
those kids that were baling hay at 16, 17, 18 years old that were working on the farm and they, they get the tan from the sun and the muscles from the work. And then, and that's not enough. You can't stop there, but how many people have never experienced that at all? I, I think about going on vacation to beach vacations and the people who go on a beach vacation and they are literally wearing long sleeves, long shirt, the giant hat. And I'm like, why would you go to Cancun? Why, why, why would you even come here? Like, you're so terrified of the thing that humans have been exposed to for all of human history. Like, how how bizarre. And so you start to think about, like, if as, as we start to go down the, the line of – Where's a good place to start? Like Carl, you were talking about you need to go plant your radishes. We're the same thing. We've got our we're working on our garden this week. That's a great place to start. Go out and get in the sun and do some basic manual labor in the sun. It's incredibly satisfying. And he saw the same thing. The sun does this thing to your skin, does this thing to your mm. begins to give you the appearance of uh and and not fake, yeah. right? Because again, like there are tanorexics right we see that all the time we're not talking about joining the tanning salon and going and laying in the unnatural bed every day or every other day to turn your skin dark brown we're talking about actually getting in the sun i can i can get eight minutes of the turbo tan though or i can go out and work all day that's right come on man like i want my that's instant right. tan there's a bit in here where uh, mishima talks about he can tell by the pallor of other people's skin you know the, the sort of person they are, the, you know, the, the kind right. that sit inside as I sit in a basement on a Zoom call, you know, we're all, yeah. we're all as far away from nature as we could possibly be. I don't think it's right. We have a, we have an inversion. I did a, a, a talk a while back and I looked at nobility and how it's changed. And so you read like, you read the Greeks and the nobility is like Achilles, you know, who is pretty impressive, bigger than everybody, faster than everybody. Uh, and all the other kings are just like it. They all have to fight. And then, and then I we go to. If you look at paintings of kings of France, and they're skinny, their shoulders are narrow, their mm -hmm. skin is pale. If they went out in public, they would put powder on it to make it more pale. They would wear wigs so that you couldn't see their hair, and it just the nobility becomes more and more shrunk. And what happened? I I don't know. I don't know. I think. Look, all right, even back in in uh, in Homer, uh, my favorite author in the world, the women folk that are high class women folk will be called white armed, like white armed Hera. And yeah. I think I don't think that's referring. I, I think that's because they don't have to go in the sun and sure. do any work. Sure. And so, not being tan became a sign of wealth, <laughs> prosperous, and privilege. <laughs> And then people would Wait, seek yeah, that out. Prosperous yeah. Yeah. I like the Rubens paintings, you know, that all those yeah. uh, prosperous ladies that he painted. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> still well, a fan. Still a hashtag. Still a fan. <laughs> 2021. Yeah. It, but it, it's weird how it's shifted. And I think it needs to shift back. I think you need to get out in the sun. You need to do stuff. You probably need to lift. We can help you. And for me, so I just did my, my lousy deadlifts. I'm not a good deadlifter. The pitch never changes when I deadlift. It's not heavy enough. <laughs> but you know, I'm in my head all the time. And then I did press and deadlift today. And, you know, there's uh, whatever was on the barbell. That's what I got to lift. And the mind shuts off for me. And it's, I don't know if you guys think the same way, but to shut the mind off is a good thing. Yeah. If it's running all the time, it's like, shut up, shut up, pull this barbell off the ground. And you can't, uh, my deadlift is heavy know. enough <laughs> that, uh, I can't think while I do it. You know, we say, we joke, people get dumb when they have weight on their back. They do. And it's a good yeah. thing. It's a good thing. Yeah, I, I always think about I don't think I don't feel like my brain shuts off as much as I think it is laser focused mm -hmm. on the simplest of things. Like it's just it's not I'm not thinking through all of the all of the physiology or the physics or the mechanics of the lift when I'm lifting. It's just it's the one thing. It's the and there's a, there's this 
bizarre level of focus that occurs. But the focus is very simple. It's not like when you're doing a high order task, you know, where your where your brain is just firing on. It's not. It's the. It's not that at all. Uh, but it's yeah. It's really. It's actually. It's wonderful. It's a, it's a wonderful feeling to be able to go through that. You said it's not like doing a high order task. I I think maybe it maybe it could be. Uh, when you're when you're squatting real heavy, you can't multitask. Right. A PR, a personal record attempt on your back, and you unlock the knees and hips. You're headed for the ground. Uh, you can't be thinking about okay. When I get done here, I've got to go pick milk, and I need to call. So you, you can't do it. And the the immense no. pressure on the soles of your feet and the bar on your back won't let you go think about anything else. You know, uh, evolution or the great magnet or whatever it was that has caused us to be the way we are. Uh, when the stakes go up, we tend to get very very focused, and the squat in particular can can help teach people how to do that. I think what we do when we quote unquote are multitasking is we're switching very rapidly from one single thing to another, another single thing. Yeah. It means you're scattered. Yep. You're scattered. And, and to become one, let me get metaphysical mm -hmm. to, to take the scattered self and become one self in one moment. You know, these are the best moments in your life. And believe it or not, a heavy squat is one of those. Every yep. aspect of you is aligned with that uh, single con task at hand right there, which is to get up out of the hole and rack that thing again. I didn't have my phone on silent last night. And this friend of mine texted me at 2 a.m., a friend Dustin. And he had seen a video of Jen Thompson on Instagram doing squat walkouts. I love Jen Thompson, by the way. Huge bitcher. 30, I don't know, late 30s woman. Benching in the mid 300s. I was going to say probably early 40s. Yeah, she could point. be. Uh, she might be 42, something like that. Benching in the mid to high 300s. Yeah. She's yeah. super strong. And at 132 pounds. Yeah, at a time, you would, right. You would never, I mean, she she looks fit and she looks strong, but she does not look like a bodybuilder. Is she bulky? She just looks like a <laughs> nice looking. She was huh? doing squat walkouts at five. Is she not bulky? Five. Not bulk. She's not bulky. And in uh, in my friend, he's like, WTF? Why would anybody do this? And and he isn't into the in the area where he's testing, you know, maxes or or anything, you know, singles yet. You know, he's got, you know, I've got him chase triple three rep PRs, but that ain't nothing like a max single. And and I told him, <laughs> it takes some practice. <laughs> and if you put an extra hundred and fifty pounds on the bar and walk it out, your brain is going to learn a lot about what it takes. To, to do that. So when it's showtime, you're going to be ready. 555, if you know, she probably squats 400, would be my guess, something like that. And put 555 sure. on there, her body's learning a whole lot of stuff. And then you stand there for 20 seconds and you rack it. Sure. For your listeners that don't know, it's just almost everybody knows what a squat is. You know, the squat down, squat back up. Obviously, we're, we get real pedantic about how to do that exactly right. But we're literally talking about what she was doing was putting 555 pounds on a barbell taking it out of the squat rack with it on her back for 15 seconds and yeah. walking backwards with it for two steps, mm. probably standing there for a few seconds and then walking forward with it for two steps and putting it back into the rack. Like literally it's just what, just taking a few steps backwards and a few steps forward with an ungodly amount of weight. Now, why, why is she doing it? Yeah. What's the heaviest walkout you've ever done, Carl? Six fifteen. Oh Lord. You know, I've got a story. <laughs> Well, what do we do in strongman? And for those of you who've seen World Strongest Man, I one time at a competition had to do a 70 foot long yoke run, which is a squat walkout. It's basically standing up with weight uh, on your back. And I had to yeah. go down the street 70 feet with 1,030 pounds on my back. <laughs> but, but you think I'm like this? It's not a Reynolds exaggeration. 1,030 pounds. You stand up with it. And it's only it don't you know it only moves about two inches. It's like it clears the ground by about two inches, but it's over a thousand pounds on your back. And then you see who can run the fastest down the road with it on your back. This ridiculous sport, by the way. <laughs> it's a terrible idea, but it's uh, oh man, I haven't really done walkouts, so it was just a six fifteen attempt. Right, don't, right, right. Yeah, don't tell my coach I don't want to do them. <laughs> Yeah, so I think it's probably better than better than yoga, better than meditation, as far as focusing the self into a kernel. Well, she wasn't thinking about the groceries. No. That's the point, right? 
She wasn't thinking about and she wasn't thinking about the fight she had with her husband the night before or or any of the other stressful stuff. She was thinking about don't die right now with this weight on my back. And that seems scary, I'm sure, to people who've never done it before. But there's actually something that's incredibly freeing about it. it isn't this what you see all the time is that often the thing that people will attach and they'll, they'll say, God, I just feel like I would just like it's like they would be in bondage to it is actually the thing that often we feel most free being able to do. Mm-hmm. Like, I feel like that kind of stuff is actually it's the opposite of being in bondage to the thing. It actually sets me free from the rest of the crap, being able to do the heavy lifts, being able to refine my body by sun and steel allows me to actually break the bondage of all the other junk that I deal with on a daily basis. Yeah, absolutely. Um, can I read some more Mishima? Oh, yeah. We got a book here, yeah. Yeah, we do have a book. <laughs> this is excellent. Uh, on page 25, I think, uh, there's a parallel between, uh, strangely that I should mention this on online great books, but a parallel between barbells and books. The nature of this steel is odd. I found that as I increased its weight little by little, the effect was like a pair of scales. The bulk of muscles placed, as it were, on the other pan increased proportionally, proportionately as though the steel had a duty to maintain a strict balance between the two. Little by little, moreover, the properties of my muscles came increasingly to resemble those of the steel. This slow development, I found, was remarkably similar to the progress of education, which remodels the brain intellectually by feeding it with progressively more difficult matter. And since there was always the vision of a classical ideal of the body to serve as a model and an ultimate goal, the process closely resembled the classical ideal of education." I just think that's perfect. I never really thought of it as a balance. So you put more weight on the barbell and the muscle in you goes up to match the weight. You become like the steel. Uh, And I love the image of it being like classical education. Classical education, a lot of it is, uh, I mean, we read these things because, in our opinion, the, the smartest people read these things. And you want to be like them. And so you have the classical ideal in education. And then uh, if you think of uh, statues like that, the famous one of Perseus, uh, buck naked, holding the head of Medusa and a sword in his hand. And, uh, you know, that's the classical idea. That's what you want to be like. So there's an ideal in the physical and an ideal in the mental. And you get there the same way. And I tell people all the time, whether it's about books or barbell training, like the time is going to pass. Are you going to have read the stuff or are you going to be stronger? Because the time's going to pass. You know, so you do a little bit every day and the time goes by. And then at the end of that, whatever that time is, you have what your work has gotten you. Hopefully. Well, no, you will, actually. I don't have to say hopefully. You will. Yeah, absolutely. Let me go back to this strongman stuff. All right. So I can hear some of our listeners are probably thinking, strongman, that's crazy. Well, yeah, it is. But... It's so much fun. I have only done it as a spectator. And I got to be six feet away from Brian Shaw and watch him do one of those yoke runs up, you know, up the hill at the Arnold Classic. And uh, it's just, it's incredible. It's inspiring. I don't know how to describe it. It's um, that there are people who can do these amazing things is glorious. And to see it is the same thing. And Mishima says somewhere in there, um, you know, people are going to say, well, what are they doing? That's crazy. He says, I have yet to hear hero worship mocked by a man endowed with what might justly be called heroic physical attributes. (laughs) So I'm no Brian Shaw and I never will be, but I've lifted a bit and I see that and I'm like, that's amazing. He's not doing it for health reasons. I know, but it's amazing and wonderful. I don't know if I'm expressing myself appropriately, but <laughs> but if I were, you know, 155 pounds, I might look at it and say, well, actually, that's not healthy. Right. Or he's stupid yeah. or I'm smart. Well, isn't that the – I remember a couple of years ago posting Rachel had my, – my wife. It's a family affair for us. We live together. We love it. I love lifting with my wife. And I'm a lot stronger than my wife. I've been lifting for years. She's pretty strong too. Scott's the same way. Charity's super strong. Rachel had competed for the first, I think for the first time and had done really well. I had lifted pretty heavy weights. She had squatted 347 pounds and deadlifted 402 as a 40 year old soccer mom. And 
either we had posted it. We're not really on Facebook or social media. Somebody had posted maybe and tagged her. And it was amazing <laughs> how the most unhealthy members of her family then judged her publicly about how unhealthy that was for her and how all of the muscle would one day turn to fat. And these are the people who drink hey. a, a, you know, a case of bush light and smoke three packs of cigarettes every single day and are already <laughs> 80 pounds overweight. No one else who had been pursuing hard things physically, not even strength, right? I've never had anybody who runs marathons. who It's a completely different physical attribute, physical thing. I've never had any of those people post on our Facebook and tell us how stupid we are for lifting weights. Because even even they know the dedication that it takes to do a hard thing. What's amazing is that the people who are the sloths, who you know, treat their body like it's just this thing to throw in the trash will judge others. And I think that's, that's what you saw when you saw Brian Shaw, you were in awe, Mm -hmm. but you know, there are members of our family and members of people that we deal with on a daily basis who would look at that and say, (laughs) that's crazy. And he should be thrown in prison for it (laughs) or whatever. (laughs) That's That's, Still, what is he? Six foot nine. Yeah. And about four forty. Yeah. Just amazing. It's a big boy, Nephilim. <laughs> there were giants in, on the earth in those days. Yeah, it makes me believe in it. <laughs> Seriously, I'm going to go, all right, that's possible. <laughs> that's, I've seen I've seen Shaw and Thor. I think uh, Mashima's right. I think the more that we partake in the heroic, the, the more we're able to uh, recognize it and appreciate it. So what do we do if you live in a nation where there is no physical culture, there is no heroicism? or scared of everything. Uh, and if you can't get some, how will that person be treated? The, the, the person that, that does this necessary thing that's heroic, uh, not having a healthy physical culture. I don't know if it's a sign of societal decay or a cause of it or both, uh, but it's pretty spooky. Pretty spooky. Yeah. Yeah. I saw an interview with Mishima, obviously towards the end of his life, which didn't last very long. He was talking about death, I think, and it was something about the best thing is to die in a glorious cause. And then he looks in the camera and says, but there are no glorious causes anymore, Uh, which I think was his problem, which is he tried to manufacture one at the end. I, I don't, not planning to take that choice, but I think one of the, um, the best things that Matt Reynolds ever did was come up with the voluntary hardship thing. Which I didn't come up with, just FYI. <laughs> Where'd you get it from? I think I first heard it actually from, <laughs> from I think the term I heard from Mr. Money Mustache on huh. an interview on a podcast. But I remember stopping the podcast when he said the word. And of course, he was talking about living on $20,000 a year so you could retire at 35. Mm-hmm. But I stopped the podcast and sat and thought about, well, this is what we do. This is what strength training is. This is what we're doing. We're doing. We're yeah. choosing to do the thing that's hard. And and I know there's people out there that that mock and say, "Well, it's not real hardship, and and uh, if it's voluntary, it's not hardship." But it's true, I guess, in a sense. Mishima, I was reading up on him. I think he wanted to go die for the emperor, and he had a cold and was sick, and he could, he didn't qualify. Well, the only way he's going to die for the emperor is if Japan is at war. Okay. What if they're not at war? Do you then lead a life where you don't have hardship? I hope that there's not war. I hope that my kids don't get drafted and have to go into a war. I would rather we live in peace and prosperity, but you still need the hardship and you got to get it somehow for your physical well-being and for your intellectual well-being. Uh, so I'm reading Mishima thing. This is, this is Japanese Matt Reynolds. <laughs> All right. I want to keep my eye on him. He's got stuff ahead of him. Even the soldiers, right? Even the best of soldiers have to perform voluntary hardship mm-hmm. so that they are ready when it, the involuntary hardship is thrust upon them, right? We, we don't take a 18 year old kid out of high school and drop him in Afghanistan and go and say, go like there's that. That's that's why you go to basic. That's what now certainly we can argue if there's enough voluntary hardship that we're currently putting 
soldiers through and but but like that's the idea like you don't go to war without training for war you don't you don't compete in strength sports without training for the strength sport you don't you know like you, you can't get real tan until you've been out in the sun for two minutes and then five minutes and then 10 minutes and then 12 and so on and so forth i am a online coach and because i am who i am i get a certain kind of client and right now i am absolutely lousy with baby boomers. This has nothing to do with the book, but it's just on my mind. It's heavy on my heart, Matt. And, and since I don't get to go on Barbell Logic all the time, if this is going to be simulcast on Barbell Logic, so Barbell Logic people can listen to this, these baby boomers are killing me, Matt. I'm talking about you, Charlie. You know it, and others. Uh, anyway, you were talking about training for war, you know, and to train for something, you really need to simulate that thing as much as you can. I think that's pretty pretty obvious that if you're going to train for war that you would need to use some live fire exercises and that playing jacks is not going to help that right and his bench press he's benching 80 for three by five he has some shoulder problems so that he has to use a, a, a narrower grip than i would like so he doesn't use as much muscle mass as maybe he might but you know his shoulder's 63 years old so that's what we do and uh and he's he's got a dead spot that he has a hard time getting through to the lockout so I've been having him do bench press lockouts from the dead spot uh, as a supplement one day a week. He says, Scott, and he's done them twice, two weeks. He's done them twice. And they weren't heavy enough the first day because you're just guessing what it's going to be, right? I'm As the programmer, I'm kind of guessing where they need. I mean, they weren't heavy enough, and he's old, so I'm not going to just dry it him into the ground. And he emailed me. He said, hey, man, uh, I've had a lot of luck with diamond push-ups in the past. I'd like to do those instead. And I was like, no, absolutely not. That's the dumbest thing. Sure. I, I was like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's one of the greatest things that we're able to find as coaches for our clients is when we find the thing that they're the worst at. And I, I always try to explain that to my clients. Like when I find the supplemental list that they really hate and that, and, and the, you, you know, you compare that supplemental lift, that supplemental lift right. is just a, a similar variation to the main lift when we when we use that term supplemental lift that's what we mean when they have to reduce the weight by like forty <laughs> percent and they're like why is this so hard you're like we found it we found the thing right like we found the you know it's trite but we found the weak link in the chain and now we get to make it stronger via voluntary hardship if we just do the thing we're great at is it really that hard. Is it really that hard? You know, and so we find that that's that's one of the, to me, that's the light bulb moment as a coach when I'm able to find the thing that is the true weak point for my clients. Then I go, ooh, we can fix this. And now it won't be the weak point anymore. That's right. Can we find the, uh, find the muscle that modernity has uh, taken out of use, like Mashima says, and, you know, and have him do those you know, press or bench pause bench, or pin bench presses, you know, from that dead spot. And, uh, so here's the speech I've been getting my baby boomer clients. When I, I, had, I did a, a, a new client phone call and uh, I, I've been telling them this, no social comparison. Your squats are going to look terrible. Your hips are in their seventh decade. Uh, you've never done this before. Don't look at anybody else. Don't look at, I don't want to, because they, they, these boomers do this to me all the time. They're like, yeah. I don't know why my squat doesn't look like so-and-so. It's like, well, your bones are different lengths and you're old. So no social comparison. And then the <laughs> other one is, uh, well, it's, there's three points. The other one is number two, uh, 60 is not the new 40. You're elderly. And I'm the first person that's ever told these people they're elderly. This I've got a guy. I told him yesterday. I was like, new client call. Sure. These people are mostly the clients I get are new to physical culture. They're taking up Mishima's <laughs> challenge for the time at 64 years old. And I was like, you are elderly. He's like, oh, I'm doing great. I was like, shut up. You go file paperwork for Medicare in seven months. You're elderly. <laughs> And then number three is, you hired me. You might be a baby boomer, and you might have loved the Beach Boys in 66, but you don't know <laughs> shit about this. That's why you hired me. So listen, and I'm going to help you, and I will make yeah. you stronger. Be as a child. If I were your baby boomer client, all of my lifting videos would have, like, Steely Dan <laughs> and other 
with uh no and uh margaritaville <laughs> <Little Jimmy laughs> buffett in there just but but and you and i did the podcast for so many years on barbell logic is that it's the the we actually celebrate the fact that they've chosen to start this journey we just i think what we're doing and what you're doing often is that you're making sure that you're managing the expectations oh you bet they, they think like listen you're not going to look like this you know masters athlete that just won the crossfit games for in the masters who's been doing athletic stuff their entire life has incredible genetics and has been taking drugs for 25 years that's, that's not going to be you right you're doing this to stay out of the nursing home you're doing this to be able to get in and out of your car. You're getting doing this to get off the toilet, right? And while I understand that in the beginning, that maybe feels like a really low standard, and it is in the beginning, that we're going to drive up that that standard line is going to slowly increase. And the goal is to increase your quality of life so that you live the longest high quality of life you possibly can. And that's, but, you know, we, we often have to have that conversation with clients. It's a lesson in reality. Oh, 60 is the new 30, Matt. Yeah. Do you remember all the shit that we took years ago when we told people at thir- when they were 35 that your testosterone is tanking and you need to understand that you're not 25 anymore, that 35 is not 25? You're not, you know, and everybody was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And we're like, listen, man, you, you guys, you're, you're, you're knocking on, it, you're, you're at the, you're at master's age. It's what's considered a master, which is, means old. And it's the word You're they no use for old I, in powerlifting. And- so this is what I think. I think 40 is the new 60. <laughs> <laughs> That's, right. That's right. I like it. I want to get a shirt that says that. That's the That's best. Right. Hey, my lawnmower is just knocked on my – just rang my doorbell. I'm going to step away really quick. Now we can say the things we really wanted to say. <laughs> so Mishima said he lacked the muscle to have a dramatic – death and he's preoccupied with death and that we're only about halfway through the book here and the more the more the book the more it's about death and it's a little much but uh i was like you know what that's exactly right like, like maybe i don't want to commit harry carry on abc trying to reinstate the you know i don't know confederacy or something i don't know whatever lost cause like he did but laying in a sing home with sores isn't necessarily isn't a heroic, you know, remarkable death either. You know, our friend Dr. Sullivan says that that he wants to have like a massive heart attack at like age eighty five while hiking with his wife that's thirty years younger than him. <laughs> I think it's what he said. You know, you know, we want to call. He, wants, right. he talks about he do weight train so he can. Uh, what does he call it? He says he wants to collapse the morbidity. Like he wants to be sick. He doesn't want to be sick at all. Like he wants to just, he wants mm-hmm. to have, live a full life. I agree with Mishima. About yeah. that. You don't have to want to, you know, off yourself in public for the, for a great cause. Okay. So one thing I really like about it, now the, the stuff on death is a bit much, especially for Western sensibilities. Yeah. It, it does get to be a bit much. On the other hand, you are in fact going to die. Okay. This might be news, but everybody who's listening to this is going to die. Hopefully not, you know, today, but at some point, your life has an expiration. Do you ever think about the expiration? What do you want it to be like? It's going to happen, whether you you deal with it or not. On 28, a powerful, tragic frame and sculpturesque muscles were indispensable in a romantically noble death. Well, I, I don't know that I care so much about a noble death on television, but I'm going to go out at some point. I would like to go out in the right way. You know, I'd like to be, I don't know when that's going to be. Uh, I would like it to be doing good things. I would like it to be doing the same things I'm doing now. I'd like to not have to stop, to not have to sit in a in a chair the rest of my life. I don't think that's noble. Right. Yeah, wasting away is about as bad as it gets. Right? That's, not, that's not the way we want to die. Yeah, you know, I was, we read a lot. We've read, yeah, that's true. you know, we did Wendell Berry a couple of times, Scott. We've doubled up on Wendell Berry. Matt, have you ever read Wendell Berry? I have not. Mm, might like it. Uh, he's a farmer in Kentucky. It's all about this, the Port, is it the Port William membership? The same characters show up in all You'll of the cry books. cry and cry and cry, Matt. Uh, They're so good. I'll get it for sure. But the characters all have an expiration. And the best ones are, you know, well, he was out in the fields and he died. That to me, that's ideal. Sure. 
you get up that morning and you think, well, I got to move the cow, got to move the cows to the new pasture. I'm going to go do it because it's what you always do. And you go out and do it and your time comes, you're doing the thing that you're supposed to do. You're not sitting on the couch watching uh, television, but you're out doing stuff and then you're dead. Yep. That's it. Well, how do you make yourself capable of doing that? You have to tend your physical well-being. You know, you said, uh, you said well, speed. everybody knows that we're going yep. to die someday. You have an expiration date. Not everybody knows that, Carl. I was running a seminar the other day, and a guy said, well, you know, it won't be long here. We're going to have this transhumanism stuff, and you know, organ, organ transplants, blah, 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 blah. And uh, a scientist know that there are just a few genes that program cell death. If we can just turn those off, then, you know, we'll just live until... There are actually people that don't don't believe it. I hope they're I hope they stop listening. Yeah, Heinlein used to have a series of books about a guy who, you know, just lived forever. And <laughs> that that eventually we would figure this out, and you just live yeah. forever. And well, Heinlein's dead, so it's going to happen. And and uh, a I think healthier humans we're not so healthy on this matter. Healthier humans know it. And they're more concerned about living a good life than an infinitely long life because they know you can't. So Mishima talks about the Greeks had this idea that if you died young, it was actually a blessing. Well, you were going to die. Coming to the reality of and really understanding that you're going to die, you, there's two responses to it. You can get depressed about it and feel like in bondage to death. Or you can feel completely freed by the thing. If I'm going to die, then I have the opportunity to live the most noble, honorable life that I can. And here are all the things that I can put in place to make sure I do that. I actually think like <laughs> you know, the old movie Groundhog Day. Talk about talk about hell, right? Like that's hell. Like you're gonna live mm -hmm. the same day over and over again for eternity for never it's never going to end. Who wants to do that? Why would you want to live forever? That sounds awful. And then the romantic lead is Andy McDowell. <laughs> I'm not a fan. Strong jawline. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know. <laughs> so it's, that's a jaw. On page 31, it was <laughs> that sense of existence in which we normally believe in such a half-hearted manner, which they had transformed into a kind of transparent sense of power. It is this that I refer to as their abstract nature. As my resort to the steel had persisted to me, the relationship of muscles to steel was one of interdependence, very similar, in fact, to the relationship between ourselves and the world. The weights teach us about reality in the world. You know, I said earlier about the people popularly now, you know, if you work with your hands, you're, you're less, whatever. And as a result of that, people kind of, stay away from their physical being. And there are so many consequences of that. And one is that we really aren't tied to reality in any concrete way. You know, if you live in an apartment somewhere and don't own an automobile, a tiny apartment in some huge metropolitan area, you're probably going to take most of your meals out, not even going to prepare much food there because you can't. I mean, just everything is unreal. Like I, I know that somehow you exist, urban apartment dweller, but all of the things that happen in reality so that you can exist are so far removed that that they can't be aware of it. Their lives are too busy, and I understand. They, they can't be aware of it. And then they go vote. <laughs> like, what do they know about the food? They didn't take shop. Like, how do they, what do they know about how the water gets to them? You know, one of the things I hate about voting is I'm supposed to be an expert on everything. You know, I have to go up on water, uh, wastewater treatment so I can figure out whether I should vote yes on the bond issue for the wastewater. Like, I'm supposed to know about everything. I hate that because I'm keenly aware that I don't know everything. And so I, I don't vote yeah. on most things when I go to the polls. Like, if I yeah. see, they've got all these judges on there. Yeah, I don't know who they are, so I don't even vote. Yep. And they're like, oh, so you, you just always vote out the incumbents. I think, shut up. Like, what if there's a good one? Like, I just don't vote. But yep. they work in the cubicle, you know, they work from home, <laughs> <Right>. whatever. And <laughs> th but, they, but they don't lift weights. 
you know, they don't understand that people get hurt doing th- all of the stuff that has to happen so that they can be. You know, I've got a friend that wears this hat that says, I farm, you eat. Those guys get hurt doing that stuff, you know, uh, and they're at enormous financial risk. And can you have a society where people yeah. vote if there are huge numbers of people who are out of touch with all the conditions that have to occur in order for them to have calories? Well, I don't think I, I don't think you can. But even if you're in one of these, if you if you live in town and you're in one, in that sure. situation, maybe you can't do some woodworking because you don't have a place to do it. You know, I get it. Go to the gym and lift some weights. It's a start. It's something. There are lots of things that you can do that will improve your life. Right? That will improve your quality of life. Having financial freedom or or having a better marriage, or, you know, there's, there's a lot of these things that have been proven to improve your quality of life. It's, it's, it's actually a lot more difficult to do those two things. And I'm not in the business of marriage counseling and I'm not Dave Ramsey and I'm not trying to, uh, but you know what I, I do know is that it actually doesn't really matter if you are who, what your demographic is, if you live in the city or the country, if you are 70 years old or 80 years old or 16 years old or anything in between, literally it doesn't matter who you are, that, that you can pick up the steel barbells with the iron on it. And if you do it for the right reasons, it will make you better. It will make you a better person. It'll make you better physically. Mm-hmm. It will make you better mentally, emotionally, socially. It does for everybody. If you do it for the right reasons. I actually think that most people are actually get better from it even when they don't start it for the right reasons. I think it, it often makes people better. I mean, most of us have no clue what we're doing when we get started doing this thing. But if you specifically do it for the wrong reasons, right? If I like, how many times do you watch the the middle aged person get, you know, go to the gym and they neurotically over exercise and lose a bunch of weight, and the next thing you know, you find out they're having an affair, right? Like there's there are certainly some things that can be steered in the wrong direction, but if the goal here for us is to do the hard things, some of those hard things, not as hard as going to war, not as hard as losing a child or you know having to deal with major tragedies like those involuntary pieces of hardship certainly we're not we're not comparing it to that but it is a, a step that we can all make and i think that are his motivations i think proper? that he saw that as something that he had never done for the first 30 years of his life and saw that there was something missing attempting to restore imperial japan well no <laughs> i mean well maybe but no the taking in the sun and uh traditional bodybuilding well, I don't know. I'm no, I'm no Yukio Mishima, but I do words all the time. I feel him. To get away from that is a big attraction of barbells for me. I think too much. I think. See, I'm even thinking about that. I think too much, but then I have to have second thoughts. I think I think too much. Do I really think too much? Uh, you people out there without an internal monologue, I think you're you're the blessed ones. So for me, I I, I find. A parallel with Mishima in that 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 um, I can see what he's where he's coming from, and I get it. I think it's a big help. I think the sun part's important. We read a book a while back, Matt. Uh, what is it? Holistic land management. It's a book on ranching. It doesn't doesn't sound like it'd be fun, but it's great fun. Who was the author of that one? Alan Savory. Alan Savory has this term, the solar dollar, mm-hmm. in there that. Uh, you want to manage your land so that you can get the most out of the solar dollar because the sun is the ultimate source of all the wealth on the planet. Uh, it's where the fossil fuels came from. It's where the food you eat comes from. It's it's the source of everything. Uh, and I think getting in touch with that, I, you don't need to tan five hours a day necessarily, but you ought to go out in the sun. We, we know that's healthy. We know, heck, this current, crisis. We know that uh, the people with lower vitamin D have a much harder time. So you people that are hiding from the sun, you have a much harder time with with COVID-19. Get out in the sun, plant something. You know, I don't know if Mishima had a garden. He's Japanese. He probably did. 
he had a, he had, but make he had a st- single bonsai tree. And and then one day <laughs> he cut it off at the ground. <laughs> because that was his destiny. You don't know that. Don't You're know. making that up. <laughs> I am making that up. Uh, no, but I think lift heavy things and make contact with the sun. I think you'll be better off. Yeah. I think that you have a hard time being worse off for having done that. Yeah. You'll certainly learn more about yourself. And I think that's really what this is. This is this is really a memoir of, of what he was learning about himself in the process of this. I think he started to do this thing and wasn't entirely sure why, wasn't entirely sure what the end result was going to be. That I, I think that's why you see it turn towards, do you think he thought, Scott looked at me with this, yeah. even from the begin, beginning, you think he knew that it was going to end in death? Yes. It's interesting. It, doesn't, it certainly doesn't start that way at all. And it get, it mm-hmm. becomes more that as the so unless he's walking us through and of course he's a, he's a acclaimed novelist so the guy was maybe he knew what the path he was taking us down, but I I wonder if when he started to do this and he started to view himself as a warrior, if he knew the way this was going to end. Maybe he did. I, I think he did. I don't know if he did when he was fifteen, but but he does say during World War II that he had volunteered for a. Uh, a suicide platoon. He wasn't going to be a kamikaze. He was not a pilot. I think he was an infantryman. Uh, so he had volunteered for a suicide duty, but turned up sick when that happened and wasn't yep. able to do it. So a cold. So even at, go. even as a young person, even because he might die of right? the cold, right? Isn't that weird? Isn't that weird? They wouldn't let him go because he was sick. Well, they, he, the thing about the suicide platoon is they got to go take out a whole bunch of guys first. Sure. And he's having and sure. he's having that sniffles. You know, maybe he can't kill his <laughs> and, and then and then he talks about he he became aware that his lack of muscle would prevent him from having a dramatic and glorious death. By twenty years old, I think sure. I think between fifteen and twenty years old, I think he was kind of in there. So I, I we I think we are all in agreement with his uh love of the sun and physical culture. Uh, so he he starts with the with the weightlifting and then later on it, uh, he takes up kenpo, which is uh, you know traditional Japanese fencing using the using the bamboo sword, boxing. So I, th- I think that we probably would all think that some of those you know martial arts or, or something like that would be helpful as well. Do we believe that words are corrosive though? With their abstract functions and how they don't map onto yes. reality. <laughs> even though, even though I work for online great books, where we throw a lot, whole lot of words at you. Uh, I think they can be, they can they can be a substitute for action. I don't think they're always corrosive. I'm going to go read me some more Mishima. So, uh, obviously, I I don't think they're always corrosive, but they certainly can be. Yeah, I, certainly they can be. Like you can use a knife to prepare dinner or kill somebody. I think that he says that when we use words, we t- attempt to map some sort of order onto reality that doesn't actually exist. And we use words to to tame that chaos that exists in reality. It feels like by the time you get to this book, which is his last book, right, is uh, before his death, that if he had his choice, he would live his life as as sort of a silent a, a silent samurai, a silent warrior who would never speak, and yet. If he did, he couldn't tell us about it in the very book that we're reading. And so I can imagine the battle that was going on with him internally to have to still explain, well, here's why the words were corrosive for me, especially for all of these years. And then for I think for him, he would say that most of the words remained corrosive, that that it was better it would be better. The wordless, like you said, what what can you convey Action. without words at all? And yet the only way we know he thought that way was because he put it in words and wrote it in a book. Words are a problem. I mean, the word dog is not a dog. There's a disconnect between you know the words that we use, these symbols that we hopefully universally hold <laughs> and, and the things they're supposed to represent. I found this little, this little section here. He says, words armed with their abstract function originally put in their appearance as a working of the logos designed to bring order to the world of concrete objects. An expression was essentially an attempt to turn the abstract functioning back on itself and like an electric current that flows in reverse, summon up a world of phenomena with the aid of wor- words alone. So he thought he could use his words 
uh, to summon up this world of phenomena before he decided that he needed to you know, use his body for something. But these words are these yeah. abstract things, a working of the logos that map onto the concrete objects well enough, and it makes reality look more orderly than it is, I think, for, for Mishima. Yeah, all of our libertarian friends, yeah. they're like, well, you know, they got all these words. <laughs> Efficient market theory, you know, blah, 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 blah. They got all these words. Well, okay. Now go govern, you know, go actually act, make it happen. Yeah. Mm. Every judgment that you utter, every statement that you make is in some sense mm -hmm. a lie. That's a tree. Well, no. Not really, because tree refers to the concept of tree. But the thing you're pointing at is a physical tree, and the physical tree is not a concept of a tree. So you have the concrete tree and then the abstract notion of tree. And so it's going to be fake. Can I say that is that tree? Yeah, but tree is a conceptual word. It's pointing to a meaning, not to an object. Yeah, it's conceptual all the way And down. that's where there's a, there is a danger well, there's a danger. We, uh, I mean, we talked about that with, we do, sometimes we do this Walker Percy essay, The Loss of the Creature, which you also might like, Matt Reynolds, uh, where he talks about going to see the Grand Canyon and that you can't actually go see it because there's all sorts of concepts already surrounding the thing. There's a, a way you're supposed to experience it. The tour guides are not going to help you because they're going to tell you the way to look at it. They're going to substitute the conceptual for the actual. Obviously, we need concepts, but that's a danger, especially when words are your trade, to get stuck in concepts all the time and to think that the conceptual world's actually the real world. And so I can say a lot of words about stuff, like that old priest who yelled at me, well, you're good with words. You're still screwing up. Solving something conceptually does not mean you've solved it. Winning an argument doesn't mean you've gained a new friend, you know, because the friend is a, a concrete person and you just won an abstract thing. Congratulations. <laughs> it's no good. Yes. So for me, what was interesting, I've said this before, what was interesting is for him, the barbells are a way for him to escape, to re-enter the world of the physical which is actually the real world. I ordered some pipe that is going to go down in my water well. Yep. 20 foot joints of inch and a quarter galvanized pipe. And I also ordered some sucker rod. So this rod goes in the middle of the pipe. And when my windmill turns, it pulls the, the sucker rod, pulls it and pushes it up, down, up, down, up, down. And that runs a pump in the bottom of the well and pumps water out of the ground. It was shipped on a, on a freight line, and I got a shipping notification. It said it weighed 45 pounds. I thought, mm, probably not. Well, the guy pulled up here at the semi-truck, and uh, it was a covered trailer, so I couldn't get it off of there with my tractor. And, uh, I, got, I walked up in there, and I grabbed it. It's pretty heavy. Like, heavy. And I grabbed not 45 pounds. But it's 20, there are 20 foot joints of pipe, and they were all bundled together with steel bands. So it was a bundle of these pipes. Not 45. And I grabbed it. It's an inch and a quarter. So it's a fat bar deadlift. And I got that thing one inch away from my shins. <laughs> and I stood up, and it's, 20, it's a 20 foot long bar, mm -hmm. elephant bar. And I'm 6'2, <laughs> and I could not stand up enough to get the ends off the ground. Wow. But I could move it. <laughs> I guarantee it weighed I guarantee it weighed 550. But it was so long, you know, <laughs> I could get I could get to lock out and move it around. It's reality unless you never actually do anything. And then you can pretend like weightlifting isn't reality. You can pretend like life isn't actually a, a series of interactions with physical objects and it's just yeah. pressing keys and clicking mice. You can put on your Oculus Rift headset and pretend like that that's a real girl. Yeah, you got to play more video games. I think that's important. If you have, dear listener, if you haven't tried it, you should try it. And you'll be sore after the first day. But guess what? That That's good. That's good news. It means you did something. 
it means you've actually made contact with the physical world and your body is telling you so. And I had a, a, a new trainee on yesterday, actually, a uh, 46-year-old woman wants to be able to play with her grandkids. She has a grandbaby, so she's a young grandmother. We squatted with, put the 15-kilo bar on her back, and that was enough. And that's all she could do. But it's the first time she's ever done anything since high school, probably. And I, I had to warn her, you're going to be sore. But you come back on Friday sure. and you do it again. But that soreness, like the pain, he says somewhere in here about embracing the pain. The pain is a good thing. It's It's something real. It means you did something. How does he say it? Something about... You can't get strong without an opponent, and the steel is the opponent. And that goes into martial arts, too. You can practice Bruce Lee moves out of a book, like some kids in my high school did. It doesn't mean you know how to fight. You're only going to learn to fight when you fight an opponent. Opponent's going to cause you discomfort, and the barbell's going to cause you some discomfort. We'll manage it. You know, it shouldn't be, like, cancer pain. It should just be barbell pain. pain. (laughs) But... You got to do it and it's, and it's real and it's good. And I'm losing my train of thought just like Mishima is. Uh, you got to do it. You just have to do it. What about all Mishima's death stuff? Page 42. I could not help feeling that if there were some incident in which the violent death pangs and well-developed muscles were skillfully combined, it could only occur in response to the aesthetic demands of destiny. So, well, I think he's suicidal. I think he has been for a long time. But it doesn't mean he's he's wrong about the noble death. Uh, aesthetic <laughs> demands. Yeah, a, a lot of times people will throw the baby out with the bathwater here. I think that's what we have to be careful of. I'm sure you guys deal with this a lot. You study all these philosophers, right, who have some wonderful ideas and bring up some incredible arguments, and then they just seem way off in other places. And I, I don't know that I don't know that he's way off, especially culturally. It's just it doesn't line up for us from a Western kind of systematic pragmatic school of thought. It, the way he thinks about honorable death, that's that is not a Western idea. It's not something that we're brought up with. So it just feels weird to to me, at least. Uh, but I but I <laughs> sure. also can understand where it came from. Here's what's weird. When I read about it with the samurai, I think it's cool, right? When you read it, when you read about it, you're like, oh, well, it happened a thousand years ago. It happened 800 years ago. Then you're like, man, that's, that's so badass that those guys did that. But then you read about it and this guy does it in 1970 and you're like, ah, I don't know, man. So, you know, I mean, I, I agree with a ton of the stuff that he wrote in the book. I, I, uh, not just agree, but can empathize with it. I felt the very things that he feels. Uh, but when it gets up to the the point of, of sort of glorifying honorable death, um, I, w- I want to die honorably, just like you said. I don't want it to be suicide. I don't need to stick a knife in my belly and disembowel myself. So I draw the, the line. Aesthetic there. demands of destiny, though. It's not just about honor. It's about sure. falling like the cherry blossom. Sure. Death in modern America tends to look like chemo or the nursing home yep. or, or whatever. Yep. That just ain't fair to anybody. The longing for death is a little weird. Nope. Um, however, I was thinking as you were talking, Matt, the early martyrs, if you read Ignatius of Antioch, his letters on his way to Rome to be martyred, and he says, don't stop me. Don't try to stop me. This is what I want. So it might just be that his his goal, the, whatever it was, the restoration of Imperial Japan is not a, a valid goal yeah. in our minds. Although I've been watching a lot of J-pop on YouTube, and I'm thinking it wouldn't have been so bad. <laughs> right. <laughs> Do we have enough distance between uh, 2021 and August of 45? Can we, can we talk about that, or is it too much? Like I said earlier in the show, like it, the emperor signs the surrender and then the Marshall Plan gets rolled out. And then, you know, what is it? MacArthur's the military governor for a time. And, and then meanwhile, 
you're just a normal dude in Japan. Uh, your religion has told you uh, the emperor is the living embodiment of God on earth. You, maybe you have, there's a lot of religion going on over there. Uh, maybe you have, maybe you have some version of the uh, ancestor worship over there where uh, your ancestors have lived a certain way. And one of the ways that you are pious would be to continue those ways. And then this emperor goes up on that battleship and signs those papers. Now, your religion's junk. You've let down your ancestors who are ha, are part of your pantheon. Like, so if you're, I don't know a lot about Bento, but yeah, there's ancestor worship there. And, uh, and if you let down ancestors to, to some degree, it would be like letting down some aspect of deity. And so here you are, right? And so mm-hmm. 1970s, only 25 years later. It's only 25 years after their religion was shattered, their entire way of life is shattered. And, you know, Perry had showed up with this uh, only a few years before World War II. You're all right. You know, J- Japan had been just set on their head. That would have been gunboat diplomacy, right? Mm-hmm. Literally? Yeah. Think, yeah. think about that. Think about how fast it occurs, right? So that's what, that's 1860, somewhere in there? 1865 yeah. or something like that. So Japan in 1850, 1840. Looks like Japan in 1540. Borders are closed, right? Like this, it's 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 Japan. It's the shogun. It's the geisha. It's the it's the tea. It's the ritual. It's and all of a sudden the borders are they're forced. So in less than a hundred years, they're forced to open borders and lose World War II, and the emperor no longer no longer is put in place by God himself, no longer sits on the throne and enter modernity. And just, ima- so there were people alive that saw the whole thing. It's 80 years. Like, bro, that's, you can see how that would completely destroyed it. Could throw a culture completely destroyed off it. its destroyed. rocker. It's a, the miracle to me is there weren't more shield societies. There weren't more yeah. m- Mishima. Did you ever hear about the communist candidate for prime minister was murdered sure. on television with a samurai sword? This was a- around this time. There's crazy stuff happening yeah. in Japan. You know, political assassination, but with a sword. Is it that crazy yeah. is what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. See, it has to be, it has to have an a sort of aesthetic flair to be a proper action with this Japanese. I don't know. Uh, They're kind of like the French. Send your hate mail to Scott, not to me. Sure. I went a few years ago, last time, and probably will be the last time, where we were in Disney World, and there was this Japanese couple, young couple, on the boat with us on the way to Tom Sawyer's Island. And, well, he was skinnier than she was, but good-looking kids. She killed him he would never sword. just stand. Oh. He would never just stand there. He'd always, like, there'd be a pose, like an an- like a from an anime or something. He was very conscious of how he was standing and how he was presenting himself. I don't really do that. I stand like a ton of bricks. <laughs> <laughs> I need you sure. to. Well, did you like the book, Matt? Yeah, I actually really, I mean, I really did. It was really, I mean, it was super interesting. It was interesting to see his thought pattern and the process. I don't know that I had ever read. It, it, it was interesting. I actually thought, <laughs> I actually thought about Hambrick in reading this some because of it's a, it's a similar sort of, I mean, here's a guy who was a Uber intellectual used words like crazy and discovered, discovered this physical reality later in life. And and that's not to say, I mean, Hamburg's always, he's, you know, he's from, (laughs) as he says, the river bottoms and Catoosa, Oklahoma and grew up doing, doing physical labor. So it wasn't like, you know, Hamburg had translucent skin, growing up because he never saw the sun it wasn't that at all but it was this idea that the guy went from being an intellectual and was like listen there was that there was something missing and the the circle wasn't closed and when i discovered this uh, this thing the physical the real the real world then it all sort of yeah, started figured. to come together and make sense and uh i thought that was super interesting to read about and just and certainly i can i can empathize as well you know i don't at all consider myself an intellectual in the same way that that i would consider you all that but I was raised the very skinny Baptist preacher's kid that got bullied all the time that was had a reputation for being smart and the good test taker and the honor roll, but 
was, you know, had, you know, I was had the hunchback. I was already hunchback and had the forward head syndrome at 12. Obviously something happened with me at 18, 19 years old when I really found the value of strength and it's, com- I mean, it's obviously completely changed my life and we've built an entire career out of the thing. So, um, and I, th- and I think we've been able to at Barbell Logic, uh, not perfectly, but in the best we know how connect, uh, strength training, the value of steel, the value of iron back to these things that actually matter in life, that it's not something that's completely separate, that we do these things for improved quality of life for not just for aesthetics, but aesthetics are a part of it. Performance is a big part of it, right? The way we interact with people around us is a big part of it. And so, so we're trying to do it for the right reasons and, uh, and we'll continue to pursue that. So certainly I, I could empathize with him. After reading him that quality of life. And, uh, and I, when you said that, I thought Mishima would have no regard for that whatsoever. That, that, sure. that phrase I'm not even sure that he would know what right. we were talking about. Does he care about his telos, Carl? Is he like, I'm a, I'm a man. I have bone and sinew, and as such, I have to use it. I think he's probably a Nietzschean. I don't think he has a grand telos, a, a grand end. I think he wants to make a beautiful life because it's all he can do. Okay. Yeah. I think that's probably right. Yeah. I buy that. I love this guy. Love this guy. He, it's a train wreck. Reading this book is like watching an airplane auger <laughs> into the ground. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, it's uh, it's it's really great. Sound of waves. We recommended that at the beginning of the show. It's just the sweetest, loveliest, perfect little love story in the world. Mm. You would have no idea that they came out of this. These two writers came out of the same mind. It's it's fantastic. Stellar. Yeah. He's deeply concerned about beauty. So when he does decide that he's not going to lift weights and that he's going to put the pen to paper, man, he and, and create something beautiful and not a memoir to publish upon his death, he can do it. Oh, right. It's really great. Yeah. It's really great. Wow. What are we going to read next time, Uncle Very Carl? Cool. Uh, I think we're going to do Sickness Unto Death, a nice little happy book by Soren Kierkegaard. <laughs> it sounds encouraging yeah yeah <laughs> i don't think he lifted and he should have actually he would have been better off there was a guy that was stuck in his head you know that to give an example he writes he had this girl uh, i forget her name that he should have married but he just can't get himself to do it he just can't take the action but he can write a whole bunch of books about well about existentialism and pretty much invented it and but he just can't take the step of marrying the girl uh, it would have been good if they'd had barbells in Copenhagen in 1870 or whenever he was. Always be closing. Did Schopenhauer lift? Um, yes. I suspect that he did. <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> Nobody looks grumpier than that guy. <laughs> I love that. But Socrates had to. Yeah, Socrates did. He was a hoplite. He was a soldier. Yeah, well, this has been fun. So, you know, you, you talked about intellectuals, Matt. I was just going to say that, uh, so whenever there's a revolution, the first thing they do is kill all the intellectuals and they're not wrong. Right. <laughs> there's another online great books podcast. You can go to online great books.com slash podcast. You can go to barbell hyphen logic.com and go sign up for coaching there. Your first month is free. If you want to do that. And uh, mm-hmm. you can, you can ask for Carl if you want. Heck ask for Matt and then he won't take you. Uh, I think I'm full. <laughs> I, I actually I think I'm full I've got a whole bunch yep and there's lots of good content on that website lots of yeah. good articles and stuff and then go to it's online being, great it's pretty well done slash podcast and you can sign up there we're going to be opening enrollment I think on the the 14th we should be right in the middle of that so go there and sign up and it's been a while since we've gotten any new reviews so go leave a review there and uh, you know only leave good ones uh, keep your bad ones to yourself and go touch your mom about it Well, we'll talk to you guys next week.